today on American Sports Cavalcade. It's Winston Championship Drag Racing, featuring action, among others, in the top alcohol dragster class. Defending TAD champion Blaine Johnson rocketed to the 1992 crown on the strength of five national events and four divisional wins. But 1993 has been tough for the native Californian and crew chief brother Allen. Mired in third place in the points, the Johnson brothers know that to repeat as champions in 1993, they have to make a point here and now. Welcome everyone to the Atlanta Dragway, just outside of Commerce, Georgia, and American Sports Cavalcade coverage of the Pram Sports National. Blaine Johnson is fighting hard to keep that big number one on his wing, but it's not going to be easy. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans, and this is the huge 528 cubic inch Oldsmobile rocket engine he hopes will do the deed. Blaine, last year you clinched the title early, like late July. Not so, I don't think, in 93. No, we had a slow start this year, but we're coming on right now. We've got two divisional wins uh, in the last two races, and uh, we're just hoping we can uh, win the races we have to to get that points lead back. You've got to be concerned with the injected nitro cars. They put down the big numbers. Yeah, they can pop off a good number every once in a while, but uh, Brooks Brown seems to be able to keep it consistent this week, and uh, we're hoping we can stay with him. Now, NHRA, there's been a rules change. You've had to go to less overdrive on this giant Whipple Charger. How bad does that hurt you? Uh, it, it's definitely been hard to make the boost that we need to make the, the car run like we want it to, but we're making adjustments internally to get that boost pressure back, and uh, we're just having to work a little harder than we'd like to. Okay, now for the Alcohol Funny Car Slant. Here's Brock Yates. Steve, you're looking at the Alcohol Funny Car that carried Jeff Rapp to the number one qualifying position here. Not only that, he got by round one yesterday, and then, as an extra bonus, got himself a bye run today. And uh, that's not a bad way to start the proceedings, Jeff. No, it gives us a real good chance to try the car out this morning and, uh, you know, see if we can step up. And if we make a mistake, it's not going to cost us the race. Lanes are pretty equal here in Atlanta? Yeah, uh, they seem to be. We prefer running the left-hand side. It's just a preference that our car likes running over here, so we've been staying there. So you're going to try to run a real uh, low ET to get that lane choice? We definitely want to try and hold on to it, that's for sure. It means a lot. Well, you got a bunch of heavy hitters here right now, so uh, Jeff Rapp looking real good at the moment. Now let's pick up the action in the alcohol classes. Let's join Steve Evans. Okay, thanks, Bob. And no better way to kick off round two of uh, Top Alcohol Dragster than with two cars that are totally different. There you're looking at the supercharged alcohol engine in the Bill Barney car. There you're looking at the injected, no supercharger, but nitro in the tank car of Brooks Brown. And Brooks Brown is the car that Blaine Johnson referred to as the one capable of putting down the big numbers. But like all of the nitro cars, it suffers from a bit of inconsistency. Brooks is a little better than most, but still those nitro engines are just so flighty to try to tune. They sometimes have a mind of their own. But Brock, I would tell you one thing, this category furnishes close drag racing, maybe the closest of any. It also, uh, in terms of these two guys, uh, is a study in contrast. Bill Barney out in Knoxville, Tennessee, one of the best in this business, was the, actually the alternate in this field. 17th qualifier, had problems mechanically. Brooks Brown, on the other hand, out of Bass Lake, California, is the number one qualifier in that nitro-powered car. That's right, you've got uh, the low and the slow. But uh, Barney, my guess is he's over his problems. He is a professional in a sportsman category. I mean, that's how good and how much that guy wins. A former food broker in Northern California, now living in Tennessee for convenience purposes. A lot uh, easier to get to the national events. Brooks Brown lives in a wonderful little town in Central California called Bass Lake. Tom Topping owns the car, and a bunch of kids work on it and drive it. Brooks Brown is still not 21 years of age. Won the Winter Nationals uh, earlier this year, and Brooks Brown is out to a big lead. Oh, yeah, Brooks Brown just stomps poor old Bill Barney. A 594 at 220 miles an hour. Barney had a big lead off the starting line, but uh, not enough to challenge the quick elapsed time of one Brooks Brown. Bob Fry? 594. It looks like you guys really got a handle on this one, Tom. Well, we got it back consistent again, I think. It's We'll see if we can step it up a little bit. We're going to need to go a little quicker from now on, but I think the track will take a little more clutch than we had in her there, so we'll give her a try. And I think they got a lot more power in that car, too. I can't turn on fire. 
Tom Tommy kidding about uh, the flames on his shirt uh, from his sponsor, the good guys. That's kind of uh, their look. Here's two of the very best in this category. We're talking about Jay Payne and Tom Conway. Tom Conway, a past Winston champion, in fact, a two-time Winston champion out of Oklahoma. He and his wife do virtually everything on this car. You can see now they've got the required amount of moisture on the tires to get them spinning without being hard on the engine or the drivetrain. The burnout's extremely important in this category of competition, as they are in all of them, but uh, sometimes more here. Right now, let's go down to Brock Yates. So Brooks Brown uh, gets off the old helmet here and uh, we we'll tell him it's a 94 and a victory for the old nitro car. Yeah, nosed over though, about half track, put out a cylinder probably. Shouldn't have done that though. We tried to tune it up, not have that happen. Got a little work to do. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll get it tuned up. We ran 79 and 84 yesterday, so I'm sure my dad, Tom's got a lot left in this thing. Okay, go get him, Brooks. We will, thanks a lot. By putting out a cylinder, Brooks means uh, one cylinder got so much fuel and it was running so rich that the magnetos could not fire all of that nitromethane. Consequently, it doesn't bring anything to the party. You essentially got a seven-cylinder motor. All right, there is Tom Conway. We talked about him a little bit uh, earlier. Seminole, Oklahoma, two-time Winston champion. Boy, is he tough. And Jay Payne, who wants to be a one-time Winston champion and is making some good inroads into that out of Upland, California. Jay Payne won the Slick 50 Nationals earlier this year in Houston on a very good racetrack. Of course, Tom Conway uh, builds an awful lot of pieces for these cars, so he tends to race a lot against a lot of his customers. Absolutely. Oh, boy, Jay Payne. I told you the racing was close in this category. They left right together, as we'll see in a moment here in a replay. Payne wins at 589 to a 591. Both of them ran 235. Let's take another look. That's Conway in the far lane, paying up close. And the reaction time's literally the same, 466 to a 67. So uh, no difference there. And it looked as if Conway was on his way to a pretty convincing victory. Ah, uh, but it was not to be. Jay Payne hung in there. I'm sure holding his breath at this point, he looks over and says, I think I beat him, but I'm not sure. Jay, that was about as close as they get in this business. You beat him by two hundredths. He ran, you ran an 89, so it was a real close run. Oh, it was, it was neck and tuck all the way down there. You looks like you came from behind. Could you see him out there? I could see him all the way down there. We had a little problem stage, and I backed up. I hope it didn't mess him up. I hope. Well, let's hope not. But no matter, you're on onward and upward. Well, he's also the man that helps us tune our car, so, <laughs> you know, it's kind of touchy. Better go have a talk with him. Thank you. We've got a couple of former alcohol dragster winners from this season going against each other, Steve. Yep, we sure do. And these are both the traditional blown alcohol style engines, uh, the type we saw Bill Barney and Jay Payne run in earlier rounds. All right, this will be Chuck Baird over on the far lane. In the near lane will be Tiffany Highland. As you said, they have both won. Tiffany won at Phoenix this year. And Chuck Baird, he was victorious at the Gator Nationals uh, just a few weeks ago in Gainesville, Florida. So very evenly matched. Tiffany Highland, I tell you, she is just an outstanding prospect for alcohol or to maybe move into a top field direction someday. She's got great reaction time. She's got a great attitude from a wonderful family. She's got it all. She sure does. And uh, she, uh, from up in Springfield, Oregon, as you say, comes from a family that knows this sport uh, from uh, front to back. Chuck Baird out of Assumption, Illinois, as we said, won at uh, Gainesville at the Gator Nationals. So two... Uh, very experienced and very, very competent drivers in very ex in excellent race cars getting ready to go here. Well, Highland qualified number five at a 589. Chuck Baird also qualified with a 589 with a four. He qualified number four. When they tie like that, whoever has the best speed gets the top spot. Uh, Mike Kosky fell to Tiffany in round number one. Rich McPhillips to Baird. And they both had very good races. So the butterflies ought to be gone. Here they are in round number two concentrating on that all-important Christmas tree in the flash of yellow. Island out first, but Baird at the finish line. A 592 at 239 miles an hour wins it for Chuck Baird. Tiffany Highland not far away at six flat, 229. On the starting line with Peter Dove, the crew chief for Chuck Baird, here's Bob. Pete, he drove out of a lot of tire shape there. It's been, it's been shaking all weekend, Bob. We can't can't seem to get it to quit. The racetrack's a little slick, and we've been having some fuel curve problems, but we're getting on it. Some field of cars, huh, in this final eight? You bet. You bet. Uh, old Brooks Brown's being pretty tough, and, and Jay Payne's going to be tough, so we'll see what we can do. 
got out of that tire shake and whoa, 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 won the race. Yeah, that's what tire shake do, 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 does to you, too. It's very hard on the driver, hard on the car. And it's when the motor and the clutch confuse the tire, and the tire doesn't know whether to stand up or lay down or do what's well, not the tire's fault. It's the mechanical setup of the automobile. There you saw a burnout from Bill Reichert. You're about to see one from Blaine Johnson, the man I talked to at the top of the show. Who knows, that here in Atlanta, he's got to make a move. You can always tell the driver using the big Whipple charger. It blocks out the entire tower. All right, let's go down to Brock at the far end with Chuck Baird. Well, Chuck, a good clean pass, a 92. We just can't get down it without it shaking. Car will run a lot faster than that, but we just, all weekend, we just can't get it to quit shaking. What do you figure? It's going to be, uh, that's off the pace a little bit, but uh, you got to step it up a lot, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not going to get it. We're going to have to do something, but I don't know what else to do to it. We've done about all the, pulled all the rabbits out of the hat that this old farmer knows how to do. <laughs> well, you're still in a semi, so it can't be all bad. Thank you very much, we all. Well, he started to come around at the end, but I think at the top of that interview with Brock, you could see what tire shake physically does to a driver. Chuck Beard was a little bit rattled and confused and uh, trying to get the filling stuck back down in his teeth. But it is really vicious stuff. All right, Bill Riker, there's a great shot down inside the cockpit. All kinds of levers and handles. These guys use three-speed transmissions. Uh, you'll hear them at the starting line bring the RPMs up tremendously. Alan Johnson goes in to double check. Make everything's all right with his brother Blaine and to pump him up a little bit. The brothers from Santa Maria, California, on the Central Coast near Vandenberg Air Force Base. Bill Reichert out of Owasso, Michigan. And I don't know where that is. <laughs> but I do know they're both in the starting line here in Atlanta. And uh, you always got to give a little bit of the edge to Blaine Johnson, no matter who he races, and especially as hungry as they are to get back into the thick of the points thing here. Ooh, Johnson a little late. Actually, the car spun the tires, made it look worse than it was. Richter's got a chance. No, to the relief of his father, Everett, it is Blaine Johnson to the next round at a 5.93, 231 to a game 601 at 225. Let's go down to Bob with Everett. Hey, Dad, nothing like a flare for the dramatic. That one wasn't easy. No, it was close. I don't know what happened. It smoked the tires pretty hard, and it'll get better at the next round. It's a nasty field of cars here, isn't it? Oh, boy, they're tough. Family that stays together wins together, and they go another round, might just win one more. Let's have another look at it. Watch Blaine Johnson in the near lane. Was it him or the car? A little of both. You saw he was a bit late. There's the tire smoke Everett was talking about. That hurt him in the elapsed time department. But Blaine Johnson, once he got it into high gear, just flat took over and marched his way past Reichert. Well, snuck his way past, would be a little more accurate. A 593 to a 601, Blaine from behind. All right, here are the pairings for the final four in the alcohol dragster ranks. Jay Payne up against Blaine Johnson, and Jay Payne will have the lane choice. So far, we don't see where that's a big advantage. Chuck Baird will race the nitro car of Brooks Brown. Baird has the lane choice. And there again, I don't think Brooks Brown much cares about that. Well, Blaine, I, I would imagine that was a lot closer than he wanted to be at a 93, but he gave he was in it all the way. And I think you were a little late. Yeah, I, I knew I was late off the line. I could hear his motor all the way down there. I was just hoping we'd get a big in charge with this with this car. And I guess we got just enough. I was really nervous going down the track. I just hope I made the shift points right and didn't get too nervous. but. I was a little nervous this morning. I was really worried about getting a reaction time and not getting a red light. You know, I think it'll go be a little better now after the first round's over. Good deal. Go get him. Thanks. Well, there is the pits of uh, Coroner Tom Topping. He and all of his adopted sons hard at work to get that machine ready to face Chuck Barrett in the final four. Atlanta, where the Fram Sports Nationals continues. Uh, we are about to get into round two action at Top Alcohol Funny Cars and Steve Evans. Who does not recognize that funny car of Pat Austin's? He has driven that automobile and ones like it to more victories than anybody else except Bob Glidden and Winston Championship competition. And his father, Walt Austin, you just saw there, deserves a lot of credit for that. He is the mechanical brains behind the car. They, too, are using that huge Whipple supercharger. And NHRA, uh, Mr. Austin doesn't agree with this, but NHRA has now toned down the boost on those blowers. They're a screw-type supercharger and capable of making a lot more boost consistently. So to keep the competition equal, NHRA said, hey, there's a line here that you can't cross. Tony Bartone is over in the far lane. That's another great family operation. He and his brother both run alcohol cars, his brother and the dragster, and they're out of uh, 
New York City, where they operate uh, New York Paving. Tony Bertone, old Westbury, New York, is his home out of Long Island. He is a tough customer. Has not won yet this year, though. Pat Austin, we've had four races. He has won half of them. Austin from Tacoma, Washington, and he's put that car in the winner's circle at the Motocraft Nationals and the Slick 50 Nationals. And here he goes into round number two. Tony Bartone is just flat New York tough, though. He is. He is. He's, uh, he's a good guy, and uh, he loves to race. And uh, he, uh, I'll tell you what, Pat Austin's got to pay attention to Bartone. Oh, absolutely. Now you hear the RPMs just scream. They use a pedal clutch, have to change gears twice. I think they're the hardest cars in all of drag racing to drive consistently. Bartone was off the mark first. Austin sideways tries to come back. Can't do it. It is Tony Bartone. 602 at 235 miles an hour to Austin's quicker. 601 at 236. Bartone's hole shot paid off. Huge dividends. Watch the car in the far lane. I think you can visually see him move quicker. Yes, he did. A 4-2 light to a 4-5. Only, well, a little over 200s, but that's big time hole shots in alcohol racing. And here, Austin, kind of, there's a little bump on the racetrack, and I think he hit it. It took the car sideways. It started to hunt his way down the racetrack. He kept it off of the wall, but could not get around Tony Bartone. Here's Brock Yates with the winner. Well, Tony, that was some kind of a good race. Hole shot. Uh, he ET'd. You had a 601. You had a 602, but it was a hell of a race. And uh, you uh, launched real well. And I think he had a little tire shake, but you made a great pass. Well, uh, crew did a good job, and I was lucky enough to get the hole shot against Pat. Uh, the Austin team obviously is good all over. Uh, the car runs well. Pat drives good. And uh, anytime you can uh, beat Pat, uh, you've done your job. He you sure did. Did super job onto the semis. So did the crew chief on that car, Steve Boggs. All right, a hug for the fiance, and we go back up to the starting line where our number one qualifier, Jeff Rapp, will have a bye run. Brock discussed that with him earlier, as I'm sure you saw. Now, Rapp qualified number one at a 595, and those are the kind of numbers I think it's gonna take to win this thing, Brock, before it's all said and done. Right, Jeff uh, is running this car. The car's out of Texas. Uh, Jeff is uh, yet another one of that kind of New York area guys. He's really good pals with Tony Bartone and that group. But uh, Jeff, as you said, wants very badly to get a lane choice. He's got a single here, but uh, it's still almost as important as if he was racing somebody. Oh, absolutely. He's racing the clock. And he'll also try to keep his reaction times good. Uh, you you, you want to pretend you're racing somebody every time you get on the racetrack, whether or not they're there or not. You've got to get that mental mindset that I'm going to whip whoever it is over there, even if it's a phantom. All right, so Jeff Rapp brings the R's up, lets that clutch out, shifts those gears. The car hunts its way. Typical alcohol funny car style down the racetrack. A 603 at 236 miles an hour. Rapp is right in there. Steve, uh, this is an interesting matchup in round two, top alcohol funny car. Chuck Cheeseman going against Randy Anderson of that famed Anderson family out of California. And I think there's a revenge factor uh, perhaps at uh, play here on the part of Chuck Cheeseman. Absolutely. Last year at the U.S. Nationals, the biggest drag race of them all, that man, Randy Anderson, pole shot at Cheeseman, had the better reaction time, one with a slower elapsed time. I guarantee you Cheeseman would like to turn the tables on Randy. Randy, the son of Brad Anderson, Brad Anderson Enterprises out of Ontario, California. Brad Anderson told me this car has no budget. It's whatever it takes. What a luxury that is. Chuck Cheeseman, he isn't going to tell you that. He's going to tell you we're on a pretty tight budget and we need to beat this guy to uh, get a little traveling money to get out of here. <laughs> okay, in Atlanta, Georgia, Chuck Cheeseman, Randy Anderson, and again, let's just shut up for a second and listen to these things. There's the crew reaction from Cheeseman's Bunch. And they did win it on a whole shot. A 6.02 beat Anderson's 5.96. Cheeseman, 232 miles an hour. Let's go to the starting line with Keith Cheeseman. What a 
great win and a great way to make up for last year's U.S. Nationals, huh? Yeah, great. This feeling great. I'm great. That's why the drivers get paid the big bucks yeah, for those whole shots. He knew what was on the line that time. His driver's seat. <laughs> Me. <laughs> well, I could take that to help one and sign down at least for one more round. Well, Bob, you learn after a while down there that the crew chiefs end the interviews. You don't. <laughs> they got work to do. In replay, there you can see Cheeseman. Now watch the front end of the car. When he shifts it right there, look how high it pulled the front wheels. There it pulled them again. That's what I was talking about earlier, how difficult these cars are to drive. They're just, I'm not sure they're ever totally in control. If you can wheel one of these things, well, just about anything in drag racing is within your ability range. Brock Yates is down there with a happy guy. Well, if you don't think catching a good light doesn't mean anything, talk to Chuck Cheeseman, an 02 to a 96 and a great hole shot, Chuck. That worked for you perfect. Well, that's the way you got to beat them sometimes, you know. When you don't have the power, you got to go to other resources. So, I got lucky. More than that, he got a little sideways uh, after the light. Yeah, did you see that or not? No, I didn't. I never seen him until we went right through the traps. That's the only time I seen him, but uh, he's been a little squirrely here. You know, the track getting a little greasy there, so, uh, hey. We're on to the next one. Chuck Cheeseman. That's the kind of competitors you like, the ones you never saw. All right, well, here are two of the great names in this category, both from the Eastern Seaboard, reigning Winston world champion, Bob Newberry. That's the Newberry car right there, Keystone Automotive Warehouse. The sponsor on the machine, looking in that emergency hole cut in the window in case you need to stick a fire hose in there. And there is, in his new Kendall GT1 motor oil colors, that is Frank Menzo out of Morganville, New Jersey. He is just, Ellie's just a tenacious guy. Newberry, Schenectady, New York. He's more of the scientist kind of a guy. You know, Brock, a little different personality. Yeah, he is. And he's a lot like Tom Conway and alcohol uh, dragsters because he supplies an awful lot of bits and pieces to his competitors. In fact, probably some of his stuff is on Ace Manzo's car. Maybe a whole motor. <laughs> Manzo out of control right off the starting line and he was never able to get it back on the bit. The winner is Newberry at 606 to Manzo's very disappointing 623. Let's go to Bob back at the starting line again. Robert? Eddie, nobody said it was going to be easy, and that one sure wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. I don't think it's ever easy here in Atlanta. <laughs> you guys look like you're really getting this new car sorted out. It's been good. Yeah, not too bad. We'll get it. We'll get it, and they'll probably get that number one again this year. Ooh, they're going to have to fight for that. That's a long way for being over. All right, in the final four, it will be Chuck Cheeseman up against Newberry. Cheeseman has lane choice and some great reaction times, as we saw in the earlier round. Now, the other half of the deal finds Tony Bartone with lane choice over Jeff Rapp. That could be a very interesting race, a toss-up as far as I'm concerned. At the far end, it is Bob Newberry trying to get the D-ring loose on his helmet strap when he does box there. Well, Bob, you got the win, but uh, you didn't exactly shatter any records in an 06. You got some work to do, I would imagine. Well, it didn't feel very strong on a run, but uh, we had a pretty safe tune-up. We were a little bit afraid of the racetrack. We shook real hard yesterday with a 609. Our best qualifying number was a 97, so we were trying to be a little bit safe out there. What do you think now that uh, you got the final four in this place? What do you think it's going to take to win it? Uh, I think it's going to be better in the 606. We're going to have to put a little bit more horsepower on the racetrack, and, uh, but we're going to take one round at a time, and uh, hopefully we'll be in a winner's circle. Good luck. Thank you. Always the analytical one, Bob Newberry. Well, back in the alcohol pitch, that is the Chuck Baird car. He appears to just have minimum maintenance. Not good news for Brooks Brown. He'd prefer it was all apart because they meet each other when we come back to Atlanta. Hang in there with us, folks. Yo, what? North Georgia, I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates and Bob Fry. The burnouts are completed for the first pair in the final four. It is Chuck Baird up against the injected nitro car right there, owned by Tom Topping driven by Brooks Brown. Now, there's a problem with that injected car is that it just doesn't react to his touch. It's a totally different deal. Unlike the blown alcohol cars, you don't bring the RPMs up. You leave from a dead idle, and it takes a while for the clutch uh, to act centrifugally, for the chassis to coil up, for everything to happen. And Brooks Brown gets accused of cutting bad reaction times when uh, my bet is at least half of that is just that combination. Generally, though, they got so much power, it pays off of the big end. Chuck Baird. He's got lane choice over Brooks by two one-hundredths of a second. That's how close they are. Driver reaction time or car reaction time, depending on how you look at it, could play a big part in this race. Let's watch him.
Brooks fades at the far end. Baird was out on him by four hundreds, records a 581, and the fastest speed I have ever seen from a blown alcohol car, 242 miles an hour. Bob Fry? That is a tire shaking, mile an hour running oh, beast, man. isn't it? She's a killer. Uh, we uh, we had, took a little nose weight off of it and, and changed the fuel a little bit and changed the set of tires and it went right down through there. Somebody's with you at half track there in big trouble. Yeah, yeah, we was in good shape. Gotta go. Great job. That fast car is in the finals. 242 miles an hour. Watch it again and see if you can see any of the shake they were talking about. The car from the near side. There's Barrett out on Brown. Right about there is where they really start to shake. And as we said before, all of that is transmitted to the driver. But you know, you can handle a little bit of pain when you've got a car that'll run 581 at 242 miles an hour, as Chuck Baird in the near lane did on this run against Brown. Awesome. Chuck, I'm the bearer of good news. We ran an 81. Of course, you won the race, but you ran 242 miles an hour, quickest ever. Thank you. This is, uh, we've really had some problems this week. So, uh, for stepping up, this is pretty good. Uh, 81, do you think that can win it? We can run faster. Okay. Honest. Congressions, conditions are looking pretty good right now. I think uh, maybe for the final, you should be in good shape. Thank you. Congratulations. Appreciate all of you. Obviously, what's happening here today in Atlanta means a lot to Chuck Baird. All right, who is going to race Barrett in the final? That's a dubious distinction. If indeed Brock Hitchie can run quicker than that 81. Well, if anybody can, it's uh, one of, possibly one of these guys, Jay Payne. Uh, there you see him. And in the far lane, that's Blaine Johnson. Need I say more about him? If anybody can go real quick in an alcohol dragster, it is this man. Absolutely. And they appear to uh, be getting the new overdrive situation on the Whipple Charger sorted out. They're running... Uh, as well almost as anybody else. Nobody running quite as well as Chuck Baird right now at 581, 242. But uh, you're always going to have a supercar at any event you go to. It just happened to be Baird's day. Okay, here we go. Blaine Johnson or Jay Payne. Payne from Southern California. Blaine Johnson from Central California. And there again, as we've stressed so many times, what happens off the starting line can be so important. And again, the Johnson car smokes the tires. This time, it hurts him. It is Jay Payne with a whole shot victory. 589 to a 588. He was out by four hundredths of a second, and that is a train length these days. Let's have one more look at it, especially watch the losing car in the far lane. You'll see the same thing. He was second off the mark, and look at that chassis start to go to work to transfer weight, but not enough. You saw the wisp of smoke off the tires. That cost Blaine Johnson two three hundreds, and he only lost the race running in hundredth quicker. So that was really the key to that race, is not being able to put all of that awesome Allen Johnson horsepower to the pavement. Looked like he might have had it one on the camera angle, but no cigar for Blaine Johnson. All right, here are the pairings for the final round of the TADs. It'll be Chuck Baird against Jay Payne, and need I say that uh, Baird will have the lane choice by about eight hundredths of a second. And I'm sure he's anxious to tell Brock Yates' story as soon as he can get that pesky helmet off. Brock? Well, it's whole shot time. Um, 80, uh, 89 beats an 88. Great pass. All right. That's awesome. Everything hold together. Everything is clean and green back there. Well, yeah, we got one out of the way, but now we got we to race Baird next round. He just went 81, so we got to go work on it. With some big top speed, too. Oh, yeah. 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 But E.T. still what wins races, so... And, and good starting line time reaction, and that was great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. All right, here we go into the final four of the alcohol funny cars. Brock Yates, there's a guy that's got a shot at it. Finished only 10th in the world last year and looking to move up. Yeah, but right now he has lane choice against the Winston champion, that man, Bob Newberry, as he starts to do his uh, burnouts. And Newberry really has not been showing the kind of muscle that you sort of expect from Bob. I mean, he was so strong last year and has been generally up amongst them all the time, but uh, here he's been struggling a little bit, and he admits it. Yep. Chuck Cheeseman, we talked to him after that second-round victory, and he was just full of optimism for the rest of the day. I tell you, these alcohol-fueled machines make long, long burnouts. They run no water in the block, no water in the heads. They have no radiators, no fans, but they're all aluminum, which dissipate heat very quickly, and alcohol fuel runs much, much cooler than gasoline. So if you don't need any cooling, why haul along the dead weight? 
But you still don't want to drive him down to the 7-Eleven store or idle him in traffic a whole lot. No, that would not be a good idea. But for a couple of minutes uh, from burnout through race, they'll hang together just fine. All right, Newberry will be in the near lane. And again, that's the lanes with the little bitty bumps. Cheeseman had the lane choice, and he's going to take that far side. The longer the wheelbase of the automobile, the less it's affected by those little bumps. Postdoc bikes, well, uh, they take it the worst, as Byron Hines told us, than the alcohol funding cars. The alcohol directors, I'm not even sure they know they're there. The thing is just so springy and has such flex in the chassis. That is Keith Cheeseman putting a hand out to indicate where the starting line is. It's hard to see any of these cars for his brother Chuck. And there is Bob Newberry, the big noise from the East Coast. As Brock said, he may have struggled a little bit, but Newberry, I think, when Brock talked to him earlier, sounded like, just looking in his eyes, that he thought he was on the right track. Let's watch. Dead even leave, no advantage. Newberry convincingly wins this one. 601, 230 miles an hour to a 611 and a little faster speed at 231. At the starting line with Kuti at Copper is Bob. Eddie, I'm not sure going into this round, I would have figured a 601 could take out Cheeseman. Oh, I don't know. He's been running good lately. I thought you might have to step on a little bit more than that. Next round, we will. Next round, they'll step on it. The number one guy is looking for the championship. Okay, let's watch this one again. I'll tell you, it was all Newberry. Cheeseman really was only in it right at the start when he mashed wheels with the reigning Winston champ. There was no advantage whatsoever there. So where did the difference come? Right in the middle of the racetrack. Cheeseman actually had a faster speed, but didn't have the elapsed time through the middle of the track. And that is so typical of high powered drag racing. That's where you can make that time. Well, Bob, that's a little better, a zero one. Well, we're happier with the performance number. It's getting even hotter here, so the air's not getting any better, and uh, 601's a little better. Think that'll win it? Well, I don't know. We're going to have to be consistent and not make a mistake. We'd like to go a little bit faster, but we're going to have to be careful. Uh, I think it's going to be a driver's race, and we'll have to see. What do you want to race in the final? Well, it really doesn't matter. They're both of my customers, and they're both real good friends. So, uh, you know, I wish to both of them luck. <laughs> Up until the time you whip them, right? <laughs> Up until we stage for the final round. <laughs> okay, good luck. Thank you. Well, at least if Newberry beats you, you can always just go buy whatever it is he's got. Unless, of course, he beats you up the starting line. You can't put a price tag on that. All right, it is Tony Bartone versus Jeff Rapp. Jeff Rapp, the number one qualifier. Bartone, however, has the lane choice. That goes to the quicker car from the previous round. And uh, he has picked that far side. Did no one surprise, Brock? Well, remember now, uh, Jeff uh, had a buy run. And uh, he was trying to get lane choice. Missed it uh, by just a wink, a 602 to a 603. So I suppose you can see these cars are just about dead even. Good drivers. They know each other. They're pals. And as uh, Bob uh, said, they're both customers of uh, Newberry. So this is kind of a family affair across the board. For sale is the Bartone car. Uh, it's been for sale for quite a while. I think that's kind of like my boat. It's been for sale <laughs> since the day I bought it. Actually, I believe Barton does have a new car coming. Uh, boy, what a nice buy. That would be for somebody that wanted to get the, their feet wet in alcohol funny car racing. Jeff Rapp driving for the guys out of Texas. Got the uh, hatch open uh, to get a little cool air in there. As Newberry said, it is warming up. It's an absolutely beautiful day, but it's, uh, it's inching up towards about the 80-degree mark, which uh, uh, does not help the racetrack and does not help the air. Now, there's really nothing positive you can say about that except the fans are getting a tan. But it doesn't stop frost from forming all over the injector on top of the Bartone car. We told you about that alcohol fuel, and we've got air rushing in there, and the cold alcohol fuel it actually freezes the aluminum injector. Incredible. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the great uh, advantages of alcohol uh, fuel. Its combustion temperatures are very low, and uh, it really does make horsepower. Absolutely. Okay, is it Jeff Rapp? Is it Bartone going into the final round to race? Bob Newberry. Rap was out first. Bartone almost tags the wall. That might have cost him a six flat. Wins it for Jeff Rap to Bartone. 604, 
236 miles an hour for the winner, 235 for the loser. Bartone, however, was about 600 late off the starting line, and uh, that really hurt him. He had to really run like a 594 if he uh, was to overcome the whole shot. And right there, you can see Rap. That's why they pay him the big buck. Come down to Texas and drag this car over to Atlanta. Uh, outstanding leave and an outstanding elapsed time for the number one qualifier, Jeff Rapp. Six flat, 236 miles an hour. And of course, we all know what that means. He will be facing off with Newberry in the final round. Now, there is the margin of victory, about, oh, car length and a half. So, lane choice now in that final will go to Jeff Rapp over Bob Newberry, but only by, what, one one-hundredth of a second? Another pick em here in Atlanta. Well, Jeff, uh Good news here. Ran a six flat. It gives you lane choice against Newberry. Great, great. This feels good. <laughs> you, uh, uh, everything seems to be running real good. I mean, you're real consistent. Everything seems to be falling into place just about like you hoped it would. Yeah, Steve's doing a great job keeping the car consistent every round. And we broke the clutch pedal. That's why I couldn't get off the track there. It wouldn't disengage, but uh, I think I'm sure we can fix that. I'm sure you can. You got plenty of time. So, uh, race car feeling good. Conditions are perfect. So you're in good shape. We're looking real good. Good luck. Thank you. Jeff said at the top of the show he wants to hang on to lane choice. So far, so good. We're getting a look at the beautiful tower here full of the press and visiting dignitaries and sponsors and NHRA officials as uh, it overlooks this uh, beautifully rebuilt facility here. Let's take a look at our other sportsman winners in competition. Steve Ambrose. Super stock goes to Joey Warren. The winner in the stock class, Tom Rhoda. The victor in Supercom is Scotty Richardson. Super Gas, the title goes to Sonny Elliott. Super Street, the winner is Edmund Richardson. And in Junior Dragster, a growing class, very popular these days, young Jed Barker takes on the honors. Brock Gates is back up at the starting line with the final in Top Alcohol Funny Car. And how about Jeff Rapp, number one qualifier? Here he is in the final roundup against Newberry, Brock. Yep, and uh, as he said earlier, uh, he was a customer, in a sense, of Newberry's. These guys know each other very well. They come from roughly the same part of the country. So there are no surprises here, although Newberry, has, uh, as we said earlier, has run so well in this class for a number of years now. Uh, I would think that everybody is kind of going to kind of say this is Newberry's to win, although Jeff Rapp has run very, very consistently all weekend here at Atlanta. And Jeff Rapp has the lane choice and has taken that left-hand side. His car has performed well over there. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Here is Newberry staging in the lane that Rapp put him in, and I'm sure he didn't argue about it. No, I'm sure he didn't. His, uh, they get ready to go. The revs come up on those alcohol-burning motors. Good lead by both drivers. It's a good drag race. Newberry looks like he's got a little bit of a lead, and it's wrapped at the end. Absolutely wrapped from behind. Newberry had a good hole shot going, but how about Rapp's time? 598, 237 miles an hour. Now, Rapp had a nice reaction time in this class at a 4.7. Newberry, a sensational reaction time at a 4.3. And I'm sure right now, Rapp thought, oh, no, I am in big trouble. Newberry might have been thinking, I don't see him, I don't hear him, I think I'm going to win it. But it was not to be as Bob Newberry got wrapped from behind at 598, 237 miles an hour. He's our champion, Atlanta. Jeff, uh, kind of an all-Eastern deal today. Uh, you and Bob and, uh, of course, Tony in the, in, in the semis, so uh, it had to be a real major day for you. Yeah, it was. It, it was as, as exciting as it could possibly get. Uh, tell me a little bit about the pass. I know, you know, he's always tough, Newberry. You know, Bobby, you got to watch out. He can step up and bite you at any point in time, and uh, Steve knew that. So we came out, and uh, we tuned it up a little bit, and I was a little late leaving, and fortunately for us, uh, we had enough power to drive around him. It was a great race. Congratulations, Jeff. We'll see you again up here. I hope so, too. Thank you very much. Well, Steve Evans, we've left the quickest and the fastest of the sportsman class cars to last, the top alcohol dragsters. And it's going to be a good one. Jay Payne versus Chuck Baird. Hard to make a choice here. More like impossible. If you like top speed, I guess you could go with Baird. He's uh, had the fastest one we've ever seen at 242 miles an hour. But 
Speed doesn't get you even a cup of coffee in this sport, let alone any points or anything else. It's just uh, there for headlines and uh, male ego, I guess. But uh, what a nice handheld camera shot there on the Chuck Baird car. He'll face off with Jay Payne. You see Payne sneaking around over on the other side. Uh, Baird is in the lane with the little bitty bumps in it, but as we said with the dragsters, I'm not even sure they really know they're there, Brock. No, I don't think so. Uh, remember now, Baird has the lane choice, but not now a whole lot, a 581 to a 589. So I suppose you could call this race a toss-up as far as uh, ETs are concerned. Jay Payne has out-muscled Chuck Baird. A 586 to a 592. That was a race of sheer horsepower. Payne, 237 miles an hour. Baird's parting shot a little bit faster. 239 miles an hour. Failed to hit the 240 mark again. But let's have another look. Payne had a marginal hole shot in the front line. Just a little bit. You can see it right there as those little bitty front wheels move. Now the wheel's way up in the air on Baird's car. And you can see the wing shake. They still haven't ironed that combination out. It's still hard on the car and hard on him. And that shake probably cost him just enough there to fall behind a full car length as Jay Payne extended it. That's what 81 thousandths of a second looks like in drag racing. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, it was, uh, it was a super race. Uh, you were strong all day, though. Well, we were real consistent. Yeah. And that's what counts in alcohol dragsters, I'll tell you what. In, uh, did, were there, was there any moment when, during the afternoon when you said, nah, it's a little shaky. I know Johnson went down and some of the really fast runners, and, uh, and, it, and, and it had to be looking better when Conway went away in the first round, and things probably were looking up considerably, I would imagine, the day progressed. Well, first off, we, we were the ones that beat Johnson, so that was awesome. But first off, um, Tom Conway was the toughest race we had. Yeah, and I figured it, that. It was the closest race, and he's also the man that helps us with our car, right. with our tune-up. So, I mean, that was that was like pulling teeth. You know, I mean, if you win, you beat the guy that helped you, and if you lose, oh, well, you're out of here. So, you know, that was awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of friendships in this deal, and when it comes down to the finals, oftentimes you get to end up with friend, race, and friend, or the guy that supplies bits and pieces and parts and motors to you or whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, Chuck Baird beat us oh, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago at Gainesville, right. and he beat Buried us. I mean, he he just kicked our whatever. Payback time, huh? Well, it wasn't payback. Yeah. We just wanted to win the race. Well, you did a great job. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Ah, oh, boy, he is on a winner's high, Jay Payne. Our congratulations, of course, to Jay, to Dave Schultz, and Jeff Rapp. For all of us here at American Sports Cavalcade, I'm Steve Evans saying thanks for joining us in Atlanta. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is George E. Orgera. The supervising producer is Tom Gee. Produced and directed by Mark Kuchin. The American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond P Sports.